Hello and welcome to Philosophize. Today we're going to be talking about Kroll, so if you've not seen that before, you might want to watch it before you continue to listen. Hope you enjoy! Hello, Matt. How are you doing, mate? I'm all right, Dave. How are you? I am super. So today, it's uh, one of your film choices. We're going to talk about uh, Krull from 1983, British film. And um, do you want to kick off and tell us why you chose this? I chose this because so I've only seen it once. You know, I'm not one of the people who grew up with this film. Um, I, I saw it once a couple of years ago, and I just thought it was a really interesting mix of things primarily fantasy with some sci-fi thrown into it loads of different ideas in it and i just thought it might be interesting to see if we can say something philosophical about it cool excellent so look i just gotta say i i really enjoyed it. i'd never seen it before until you um asked me to look at it and i've watched it a couple of times now thought it was went from interesting to enjoyable in the second viewing and i particularly love that shot under the titles when it when it opens and you've just got this spaceship slowly creeping through space for about well was it the intro for about five six seven minutes you start with sci-fi yeah this kind of this kind of massive black fortress this mountain stone mountain traveling through space and so you know the narrator who will you'll no doubt introduce us to sort of says this it was given to me to know many worlds have been enslaved by the beast and his armies you come in through sci-fi but then the if you like the more mythical fantasy element arises off the foundation of sci-fi so i thought that was a really interesting mix so yeah mm. good great choice mate so do you want to give us a quick overview of the film and then we can kind of start delving in a bit deeper yeah, sure. So, I mean, you've already given us the prologue there. So there's this um, big evil alien who goes around conquering worlds in a giant mountain. Um, he invades a planet which is in a feudal sort of magical fantasy setting. The opening is with the main character, Colwyn, getting married to Princess Lyssa to form an alliance between the two great kingdoms in order to fight the beasts. Um, the Beast sends his minions, the Slayers, into the palace and breaks it up, kidnaps the princess, kills everyone else, and we start off with the um, the hero's journey. Colwyn gets woken up by a, a wizard called Yanir. They go off to find a mystical weapon, which is the Glaive. Um, he actually picks it up out of lava, which is impressive. And then they go on a series of trials and adventures, meeting new people and new challenges until they're eventually able to make an assault on the fortress, which um, moves around the planet every day. They finally get there, and they save the princess, and they have a child who allegedly goes on to rule the universe, presumably in a, in a nice way. Well, yes. It, yes, it, presumably in a nice way, as we know, which uh, the, 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 the benign dictator. Yeah. That uh, th- that I thought was setting up for a sequel, if ever there was one. Mm. Yeah, I th- I thought that too. But there wasn't one, and why was why wasn't there one? I think it was a box office failure. Mm. Which I, th- I mean, I didn't actually realize this until this morning when I was doing my last minute research. But it was released four days after Return of the Jedi, and I think that's really the only reason. <laughs> you know, so I mean, they were they were it was clearly a Star Wars competitor. They were trying to get it released earlier, but it was it was incredibly complicated production. And even though they were trying to get it out before Return of the Jedi happened to try and, I guess, piggyback on the promotion for that, um, they they got it in too late and it was just unable to compete with um with the Star Wars machine. Yeah, which was already established and going strong. I mean, in a in a sense, it was inspired by it and killed by it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's um you you mentioned some of you know the, the you in passing there you mentioned some of the uh, the more filmic elements. Let's start with that because there was some really I mean I pointed to it, it when I when I mentioned the introduction the the title sequence. Not so much the effects. Some of the effects are great, but the, it's the mise en scène and the and the look and feel of this movie which I found 
absolutely awesome in, in certain places. So King Eric, who is the father of Princess Lissa, their castle, um, which is this kind of white walled monolithic. I mean, it's non-naturalistic. It, it it's it's both medieval and ultra modern. It, do you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of the kind of sets for Passion of Joan of Arc, which is an old silent nineteen twenties, nineteen thirty, nineteen thirties movie. Um, it see, I mean, it's very filmic in that sense. It's picking up on a lot of things, and we will no doubt be talking about inspiration. So there's Eric's Castle, uh, and then there is the um, the interiors of the Black Fortress, which I thought were brilliant. They're like they're like flesh and bone and organic kind of. It's like you're wandering around the interior of a body. I thought that was that was that was absolutely lovely. And I'll, I'll return to that in a second. Then there's the uh, the Italian countryside where where much not all but much of the exteriors are shot, where the places with the fire horses and you know early on when they go to get the grieve and all of that sort of stuff. So that, and they're sort of like shot in widescreen, remind you of the the kind of westerns of old, big wide shots of open countryside. I mean, it was just gorgeous. But do you know the bit above all was Lissa's prison? The first time we see her in the prison, the camera goes on this like long forward tracking shot through this kind of gaseous, mysterious. I mean, it's, it's almost like out of time and space. She's kind of like in this eyeball, secured in this eyeball. It's just this long tracking shot through this mist to this like distant eyeball that you then keep going and then you go through. Oh my word, that was just a bit. <laughs> that was just a bit of filmic magic. I know, I know you like your tracking shots with eyes. Uh, listeners, if you if you read Dave's um, book on Deleuze Cinema and look at the Star Trek First Contact section, um, you'll see what I'm talking about. Dave loves his tracking shots with eyes. Do you know what? I I I hadn't made the connection with the eye, yeah. <laughs> but I had with the tracking shots. A good point. You 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 remember that better than I do. So that's great. You have been brought here for a marriage. I am the king. You will choose. You nodded towards it in your introduction, but take us a bit more through the hero's journey and the kind of characters that are that are captured up that joined this merry band. Oh come on, Dave! You know I was bluffing. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, can you, you know I can't recite the hero's journey. I, I know. I mean, I I know a few things that I can use to pretend like I do. So he answers the call. I know that. I no, know no. I'll just talk about what happens in what happens in the film. What? Let's, so oh, we got right, okay. what happens in the films. I've, re- I've revealed myself unnecessarily. Yeah, yeah, you can edit that bit out. <laughs> talk us. Uh, what I was thinking was, if we actually talk us through, you know, the, 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 what happens on screen, that will allow us then to, yeah, talk, okay. to extrapolate out a bit. Okay, so um, Colwyn is nearly dead, and uh, Yinin... Yenea, sorry, um, turns up to um, heal him. So Yenea is, is I mean, they've all given, this is an interesting thing, they're all given kind of the name and the moniker together. So Yenea is the old man. Yep, so I think that's what we could. So you've got Colwyn, then Yenea comes in, and the first thing they do is go and get the grave, isn't it? So that's like the first bit of quest. One of the odd things about the glaive, is that it's found extremely early and not used until the very end. Um, so the, I mean, the glaive is sort of taking up the idea of like the the mystical jewel and the sort of Excalibur thing, yes. it's the thing that's needed to defeat the evil. Um, but it's found really, really early on. The oh, the Excalibur point there is really good because I think at one point Yenea says, you know, not anybody can take the grave. So. You talked about him him putting his hand into the lava, and that's kind of like a physical equivalent of only one person being able to pull the sword out of a stone. So, I mean, I, I thought about this. It's actually quite cool. It's a merger of the two things. I mean, Excalibur's the one Lady in the Lake gives him, isn't it? Yeah, but I, I think there's an uh, there's he originally pulls it. There's a, no, there's two swords, and I can't remember the name of the other sword. I so thought he throws a, a sword. Away. Oh God, we both should have looked this one up before. Yeah, we, we should have done. But I'm it. very sure that Excalibur is given to Arthur by the Lady of the Lake, and there is another sword that's pulled from the stone now what is lava it is stone oh very so good. what you've got is a lake of stone yeah oh man that's sexy as hell i like that do not use it until you need it well, how will i know when you will know you lead me to the black fortress i'll use it soon enough it will not be so easy 
Each sunrise, the black fortress moves. Sometimes it is in the mountains, sometimes in the desert, sometimes in the sea. Never the same place twice. You told me you knew where to find it. There are kingly virtues other than bravery. Courtesy is one of them. I'm sorry. It's the thought of Lissa there. Yes. Yes. Well, I too was young. Once. So it picks up the glaive there. He's told, only use it when you're ready and puts it in his pocket and doesn't use it <laughs> ever. I watched a couple of YouTube video like essays about this and the main complaint from these people who've loved it since they were kids is that it's a really cool weapon, almost as cool as a lightsaber and you don't actually see them use it that much. In a sense, it has a purpose and I think that's really important. It, this is explained narratively. They've thought about mm. this, right? Because when, when Colwyn comes out of the cave, and first, you know, re-meets Yanir, he wants to play with it, almost like a boomerang. Yeah. Yeah, to start throwing it around. He's just about to do it, and uh, the old man has to go, steady on, son. Yeah, don't get excited. There's, there, you've definitely got that kind of young hero who's not ready for the quest, and the old man yeah. who's there to teach him. Because Colwyn breaks down at the beginning of the film, crying. He's lost his wife. He's lost his father. He's lost his mm. kingdom. You know, the old man is having to teach this young man how to behave and not to be so excitable, yeah. to control his emotions. And and also, I mean, what what's established when they do actually use it in that final confrontation is that it's not the power of the Glade, it's the power of um, Colwyn and Lissa's love. And he starts shooting fire out of his hands instead. Which he takes from her, yes, absolutely, yep. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a bit like Thor Ragnarok. So Thor loses Mjernir, Mjernir, the, the hammer, Mjernir, Mjernir, that's it. Um, and then he gets told by Odin that actually it was just a way of focusing his power. The power's actually within him ah. all the way through. Although in the film after he gets a new hammer. Right? Very yeah. good. I mean, we've, talk, we've talked about that before with um, the idea of the fetish, how it captures yeah. up the world and all the power. I mean, that's what a cross Do you is. want to just say a little bit more about the word fetish? Though? Well, yeah. So what does a cross do that you wear around your neck if you're a Christian? What does a symbol mean? In a sense, it, it captures up the power of the originary world and it's the way in which you channel that energy to engage with that world. You don't need to really go towards mystical explanations here. Things that focus your attention, things that catch up, you know, it's like a rabbit foot and luck. Yeah. yeah? A, what, what is a gun, if not a fetish, that, that, that gives you your power? So you can look at it politically and scientifically if you wish to, this idea of the fetish. I mean, it's the way in which impulses and drives from the world are, are collected into, into an object. And we're going to talk about drives and instincts later, I am absolutely sure. But, but that object mm. is, is, is really good at doing that piece of work. I think I'm going to go against the tide here with all those people that say they want to see it. Sometimes less is more. And that use of it would have just turned it into a weapon. As, as you kind of pointed out, it isn't just a weapon. <laughs> you haven't lost a father and a bride on the same day. Nor have I become king on that day. <laughs> I have no kingdom. Your kingdom may be greater than you know. I give it to you, old man, and welcome to it. I came to find a king. And I find a boy instead. Look, uh, nine tenths of this film is the journey, the hero's journey, pulling a band of brothers. Yeah, they're all blokes. Yeah. Bring, uh, pulling a band of brothers together. Yeah, all of them have different skill sets. All of them got their own learning to do. All of them are going on their own journey in a way. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think in any way, shape or form it's controversial to say that the, the, the plot of this film, really, you can see the work of Joseph Campbell, um, who was an uh, early 20th century comparative mythologist, through the popularization of his book, his 1949 book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which was first, as you know, it's a, it's a bit tenuous, but why did Hollywood and the film industry start using this book? There's one of the earliest references I can hear is Stanley Kubrick giving it to Arthur C. Clarke 
as they were working on the script for 2001 Space Odyssey. George Lucas gets his hand on it, and it's one of the things that he uses to help structure his script. It's not the only thing. I think to reduce Star Wars down to Joseph Campbell, ridiculous. We know the effect that Akira Kurosawa's movies had on what Lucas was doing, and indeed the early Flash Gordon serials and all of those other things go into the mix. But it goes into the mix. Yeah. We see it in its purest form in this film. So you've got a hero who's going to go on a journey. There's a call to adventure. A mentor appears. They cross a threshold. And then there's a road of trials where the hero is continually tested and collects allies and loses allies, of course, all the time until they are they are fit and able to be able to, to complete the task that has been set them, so to speak. But the point of this is that what Joseph Campbell did was he started looking back through myths, and there's a, I'll mention this in a second in passing, but he looked back through myths and started seeing, if you like, there were certain patterns within all of these mythological stories. And, you know, he talks about the Jesus story, uh, Buddha, Muhammad, Prometheus, Ulysses, Osiris, Moses, and deep, deep down, the deep structure of these old stories, these mythologies, yep, in the widest possible sense, you see these archetypes. And from this, he, he develops the idea there is a monomyth. Interestingly, gets the word from James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, and James Joyce himself took those old stories, particularly, you know, with Ulysses, mm. he took the story of Ulysses and, you know, used that as a kind of structuring element, which he played yeah. with, obviously. So you've got this kind of underlying thing. And it seems to me that this film, in a sense, really literalizes that Joseph Campbell move and, and tries to kind of identify the elements, you know, so you do get very identifiable characters in it. I think there's both a problem and a paradox with this, and this is what I'd like to get your view on before we go even deeper into what, what this all means, so to speak. Yeah. So the paradox is, if these myths are supposed to be universalizing and structuring and deep, yep, and unavoidable, what happens when you extract the pattern, so to speak, and then reapply it back onto the story? You know, it seems to me that you can end up with a slightly conservative way of looking at the tropes, the, the archetypes within it. And I think that's really figured with Lissa, with both Lissas. Because there you've got the two main women characters. One is imprisoned the whole time. And the other one is an old woman, kind of that trope of, um, you know, kind of coming out of Dickens, um, where you've got the uh, abandoned woman who's grown old on her own, kind of great expectations, Miss Havisham kind of figure. So both of the women are kind of reduced. And I was wondering, is there a, is there a way out of that? Is there a way of rethinking that? Because you can tend to, if you like, by picking up these archetypes which are formed culturally, Yep, and kind of reinforcing them. And is there a repression of the female? They're made passive. One is is, is sidelined and only in the film for a bit. The other is is locked away. What do you think on that? I mean, I th I think there is a way of. I mean, there's always a way of subverting stuff. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, it sort of takes us away from film. But the best example I'm aware of of using this sort of pattern, but then subverting it, is um, one of the book series by David Eddings. Very, I mean, it's not quite the hero's journey, but you know, it's got very classical sort of medieval romance idea of how fantasy novels organised. Um, uh, the book series I'm talking about is the Belgariad and the Malorian, but the female characters in it are um, more developed than they would usually be, and certainly more than they are in Kroll. But the really clever thing is um, he starts writing them books with his wife um, Lee Eddings. And they release two prequels, one by the kind of Merlin character, who's immortal and has been all the way through, and you get his perspective on everything that happened. And then they write another book covering the same time period by his daughter, which sort of shows a female perspective on, on the event, completely subverting it and sort of things that he's that have been missed. Wonderful. Uh, but still yeah, but still still maintaining the sort of the vague tropes, but allowing um allowing this the female story to to occur, I mean, a bit like the, the personalist political sort of way of looking at. I'm wondering, at feminism. yeah. So look, I, 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 I think you know, 
when you talk about, and this is one of the problems of, of applying the the pattern, so to speak, in, in a very mm-hmm. literal way, that can happen. So your point about subversion there, I think, is absolutely key. So how do you, in a sense, how do you subvert those the the elements of the and monomyth to give it some kind of play, some kind of freedom? And I'm just mm. wondering if a way into that is is by calling both the women Lissa and mm. the idea, in a sense, being that. The, the filmmakers are very aware that this 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 passive role occurs in these patterns, and they're trying to pull that out and jar us with that that idea. Yes. In other words, all you know, naming them the same. You know, there is yeah. just one story. <laughs> and I, is that it, maybe it's- about, actually putting it like that? It reminds me of um, I mean, this a bit later, but um, the film Jovis the volcano where um, Meg Ryan plays three female characters um, who are completely different, but it's basically Tom Hanks' characters, all romantic interests are played by Meg Ryan. Uh, yeah, very good. Yeah. yeah, that would be the same kind. I think that's where I'm pushing it towards. How could I have left you? Your vision is your gift to me. And your vision could be your gift to me. What can I see for you? The Black Fortress, where does it rise? Tomorrow. In the Iron Desert. But the knowledge is useless to you, for you cannot leave here. No man has ever escaped the web. There is a young girl being held in the fortress. A young girl with your name. A young man seeks her. A young man. The age I was when and I met when you and I love what you ask is beyond my power it can be turned only once that is the lure of the web then the second Lissa will share your fate she will die grow old lonely she will die in a place of darkness. This whole world will be a place of darkness. If an alien race invaded a feudal civilization, how would what language would they use to describe what was happening to them? Wouldn't a spaceship that might just sort of fly off and go into different places be a bit like a massive mountain that's unscalable mm. that yeah. magically sort of transports it? And I think... Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the phrase headcanon, but I think in my my interpretation of this film now after watching again, I, I kind of feel like this is this is the mythological story that the society tells after an invasion happened during their medieval period. That is absolutely right. I mean, in a sense, it's un. I mean, it's untimely. You know, uh, alien soldiers with laser weapons would become much more like knights on horses with. Staffs that happen to shoot lightning. You know, if it's slightly taller, you know, say they're a foot taller than us, it becomes he was a giant and he had magic. And then all of the sort of mythological tropes get in. So I mean, what how how, do, how were they defeated? Well, um, the king goes off because his the queen's been stolen, and he he gets the the old man, he gets the the army, he gets the the wise people, and gets the information, and then on lightning horses goes off and saves the day. That's a re- I think that's really astute. One one way of putting it would be what they filmed is not the script, but the script after it was rediscovered mm. by people thousands of years in the future in medieval times and then talked about orally and then it's been passed down and then that's what they filmed. They didn't film the script. They filmed the myth of the script, so to speak. And that would be what exactly what James Fraser in The Golden Bough is talking about, how the myths are born in the time of magic, if you like, early pre-monotheistic religions, religions kind of take them up and with events in history are mixed with those in myth, so they can't be separated. But then they still exist and are seen through the scientific world. So that's why you get what James Fraser himself is doing, yeah? Reading these tropes through science and what Jung is doing, saying, look, these aren't these archetypes are ways in which we can think about ourselves and our drives and our instincts and what we do, Vladimir Prop, all of these people are are saying they, these things, these myths, these these archetypes 
still have immense relevance to us today. And I think that, um, sort of as a closing thought, I think that to me is what makes Crawl what it is. So I mean, it's sort of it's it's taken to be a kind of a Star Wars competitor knockoff, but I think I think that's quite unfair and as soon as you watch it it sort of becomes clear it's something very different yeah I agree. it's actually coming out of an older tradition yeah I, that is much yeah. closer to the to the monomyth and um whether or not it's it's people actively reading it i mean just as an aside when i was taught about the monomyth in in media studies i actually remember this um in gcse media studies it was a part of a pilot for my school and we got like a photocopy of something out of a textbook and it describes Star Wars as an example of the monomyth <laughs> rather than as something that was a result of George Lucas reading the book. Brilliant. Yeah, that's, <laughs> the, and that's the problem. That's the Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But, um, but you know, I mean, I've, you know, Kroll, as we've sort of spoken off, well, not off camera, off, off microphone, we've spoken about how it, it seems to come out of the sort of Jason and the Argonauts, uh, Sinbad and Clash of the Titans tradition. Star Wars is very new. It was a groundbreaking film, and it has kind of locked down the cinematic language of the future mm, yeah. quite strongly. And it's sort of it's at a point where Star Wars is still new. It's still possible to conceive of sci-fi in a slightly different way. And sci-fi fantasy is sort of leaning more on the fantasy elements than on the sci-fi elements. Yeah, it, it, this is this is a really unique film that's not really comparable to Star Wars, except from the fact that they both superficially have got the um, hero of a thousand faces yeah and i i agree i think that's a, a very kind of astute point again to say that it's kind of like on one hand it's it's you could see it's got more of a tradition you you mentioned mm -hmm. that the, the harry Housen movies there there's but it's also the kind of british robin hoods and and the american robin hoods of the 1950s it, you know, mm -hmm. it's battle sequence and its and its journeys and all of those kind of things. In a sense, I, it, one way to think of it in that way would be that it's it's the last one of the last great entries in that tradition, which isn't to do it down. It's it's no. like if you like the dying light of a star, so to speak. Yeah, it, it's never yeah. burned brighter. In a sense, it is the culmination of all of those films that really did track the hero and helpers and bands of merry yeah. men and all of that kind of thing. So it's it's not that long after Clash of the Titans, is it? Which to me is the sort of the, the real pinnacle of that sort of film. And this is kind of, I guess, an attempt to do something different with it. And I think it, I think it succeeds in its own terms. And a, a bit like something Martin Heidegger said about German idealism, if, if Krull wasn't successful, it's not because it failed, it's because we failed it. Take good care of him. Why doesn't he come? It is time to die. Well, if he's going to die anyway, why doesn't he come with us? No, he must stay here and accept his fate. If he opposes it, he'll bring great pain on himself. Oh, steady. I must remain here. Is it time? You've done enough, Ralph. Stay here. Each to his fate. So, Matt, any final thoughts? Anything that we didn't get around to talking about that you just like draw the attention to? I really thought we'd end up talking about the Cyclops' death thing. So, the Cyclops is aware of the exact point of his death, which I, I you know, I did a, a doctorate in um, Heidegger's philosophy existential philosophy, which has a lot to do with sort of knowledge of your own mortality. But with with that, it's only you know that you will die at some point, whereas the Cyclops is sort of suffering with the knowledge of the actuality of his death. He knows exactly when it's going to be. Whereas for Heidegger, knowing that you will die, but not when, it opens up a sense of freedom because it puts a limit on your life and you choose to do things because of that. The Cyclops, I imagine it would be terrifying and, and really imprisoning. Although then he has the final um, Greek tragic kick against it by choosing a different manner of death than what was destined for him. How about you? Matt, I think... I, no, I, I think um, I'm going to leave it because I, I think that's really interesting. Because you finished on Heidegger on the main bit and then you're developing Heidegger through that. I would cut off the bit with me asking, is there anything we missed? Yeah, and lead straight onto that chat on Heidegger there. Because I think that would work really well as a way to end. Death is a good way to end on this one. Um, I'm not... Okay. I'm not going to do that, but what I might do is I might, I might put a clip in between the point about that I made and then go into 
that and then we just sort yeah. of say down yeah, that's good I, that, I've got nothing that that was such a good point to end on and indeed it would have been good if we'd damn you, you know you always think why can not it go that way but yeah I, I was surprised do, do you want to do you want to do... no no that's okay. no we need we need to stop all right okay <laughs>